Welcome to the pixelated edition of Anglican <laughs> Unscripted, a Friday edition, of course. I'm Gavin Coulson. I'm Gavin Asham, and it's Friday the 15th of February, or as my wife calls it, Valentine's Day plus one. And we're back to a program. I have Gavin here. Uh, just the, usually on Friday, we try to do all three of us. Today, the schedules are just off. You know, an hour here, hour there, and we couldn't get the whole trio back together at the same time. However, I think we have enough interesting news that uh, George and I will be able to do a show. Gavin and I will be able to do a show. I also have a show uh, scheduled with Stephen Knoll to talk a lot about what's... Ooh, good. Oh, yeah, that'd be a good one. Talking about uh, the letters going around. Uh, and it's talking important. About you, should, you should balance your amateurs with experts. So I'm glad Stephen Knoll is coming yes, on. Okay. <laughs> We're all unscripted. That's the way it is. Oh, before we get going, I do need people to like the show, subscribe to the show, comment on the show. Am I leaving one out? Tweet the show, retweet the show, um, and share. Share amongst your friends, your your brethren, as it were. Okay, so let's get uh, started here. Um, just off the top of my head, how was your Valentine's Day? Oh, it was really lovely. Um, sunshine and a Valentine's lunch. Mm. Uh, I, I've, um, I've started singing again. So I, I um, went to rehearse with a rather splendid chamber choir uh, in Ludlow, not very far from here. And uh, consequently, uh, I had to do a trade. I didn't have to. I offered to do a trade off between a Valentine's lunch, uh, in, uh, which <clears throat> my wife found acceptable. And so I was out for the evening um, but but uh, uh, after 25 years um, uh, she thought that was okay <laughs> so I need to bring some people up to speed uh, you I and George went to GAFCON and the first day or two we were at the uh, um, church in Jerusalem uh, uh, Christ Church that's right eh? is it Christ Church yeah, yeah Christ yes, Church. Yes. I'm sorry oh, it's Friday and so um, I'm sitting in the front row and the first song starts and behind me, this voice just bellows. And I'm like, there's a professionally trained singer in here. He's on key. He's got the intonation. He can dictate the voice. And I look around behind me. It was Gavin. I'm like, there's a professionally trained singer behind Gavin. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so let's take the word bellow away. And, and, <laughs> some, some kind of lyrically supported melodic lilt was what he was looking for. <laughs> I'm a failed opera singer, Kevin. So, ah, uh, so you, I, I, you have a wonderful voice uh, and you, you kept tone very well. And uh, just the ability to keep that volume and intensity in a voice uh, is a major feat. I know because when I try to sing, I sound like a, um, a country singer that's had three too many beers. It's, it's you know. One of the things that, that I'm very... I become more aware of is is the extent to which singing takes place in heaven mm -hmm. so the book of revelation is full of people singing and i i have this strong sense i'm i'm i verge on being a, what's called a neoplatonist that is a, a a christian who who quite likes some of plato's ideas and i have a sense that what music does at its best is to capture tunes that that come from heaven and so when we when we have the good tunes and and right worship words um particularly words taken from the book of revelation uh, i think we really come quite close to to piercing time and space with 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 love and eternity and i think singing when it's done for the love of god rather than the, its own self is is terribly important which is one of the reasons why it causes such trouble in churches because it so quickly becomes an idolatry and an end in itself instead of a, a means to an end of loving God. But I think it's a very powerful way of offering praise and worship. Mm -hmm. Indeed. I, I, I find uh, the music and singing within church services and, you know, certainly within our weekly life, uh, an amazing part of being a Christian and an amazing part of worship. You know, it's uh, something that was just bound to um, not tug at the soul, but to, to encourage the soul. To lift There's a very the funny part. The, 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 there's a very funny cartoon script called uh, done by the Lutherans. It's mm -hmm. part of a, a Lutheran education program, and um, there's, there's one very good one where they have two Irish leprechauns explaining the Trinity. But recently, they 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 had a Western Clint Eastwood, I think, uh, doing an examination of some modern praise lyrics. Yes, and 
<laughs> I think you've seen it. <laughs> but, uh, when oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours and you are mine. You sure I got the right words here? Because this doesn't much sound like church music to me. What does it sound like? Like what would happen if my six-year-old granddaughter married a Care Bear and they wrote their own wedding vow. Uh, he, he, makes you, he makes you long for good Christian poetry. <laughs> yes. Another refrain, another reprise, another refrain, another reprise. Yeah, I guess. Oh, well. So let's move on to some news. Uh, for those who pay attention and watch their Daily Mail or other, um, the, the Sun would be a good one, uh, news <laughs> periodicals from England. Uh, there's been a lot going on this week. Specifically, I wanted to talk about the ongoing saga of Brexit and a new saga of repatriation. And uh, let's start with that. There was a young girl who ran off from uh, the UK, joined ISIS, and has found herself, after losing a couple of children, very heavily pregnant and wanting to return and be repatriated to the UK. And there's a lot of consternation on the television and in the newspapers and online <laughs> and on Twitter and on Facebook about whether or not we should let this uh, person come back so she can raise her child on your national health service. And I thought, I'm going to ask Gavin this. It's not a strictly Anglican story or a Christian story, but it's interesting to watch how a state government is going to respond to this and our church state government. So let's, let's have at it. Who is she and why is she coming back? Well, first of all, Kevin, I think it's a Judeo-Christian story because mm -hmm. it's all to do with the clash of cultures. Um, I'm still amazed that 20 years ago we allowed people to say the present situation has nothing to do with a clash of cultures when we have one culture steamrolling over another. Her name is Shemima Bagum, and you're right, three years ago as a 15-year-old, she and two other very competent, very bright Muslim girls from the east end of London slipped out of the country, having already um, made themselves known to the security services by virtue of their strong support for ISIS. And they went to become terrorist brides. So they went to Syria uh, in order to take uh, jihadi husbands uh, and breed for the caliphate. Things have gone wrong in Syria. I'm very pleased to say um, that the, the trajectory of ISIS in Syria has been halted and they've very nearly been overcome. And this means that a large number of people who fled there to support radical, violent Islam have been stranded. And some of them, uh, well, they, of course, so they, they, many of them have come from other places, and so they have citizenship elsewhere. Excuse me. <coughs> so she has British citizenship, and she has said she wants to come back to Britain. The problem is that as she's, she was discovered by a Times journalist who did a scoop of an interview with her, but as he asked her about her life, she said she had no regrets at all from what she had done. Uh, she was sorry that two of her children at the... At the um, from a jihadi warrior died through ill health and this is now her third from a jihadi warrior but she wants to come back and have it on the national health service uh, and she has nowhere else to go and life in the camps is truly awful there's no doubt it's about very that. awful yes so the americans have also said that they're very concerned about the way in which the british security forces have taken such lax steps about returning jihadi warriors Apparently, we let them in and promised to keep a, a small eye on them. Um, and so at the same time as, as, as Shuami Bagum has asked to come back, the Americans have said, we'd like to take your displaced British jihadis and put them in um, Guantanamo Bay. Well, that throws up all kinds of questions about uh, Barack Obama and why he didn't close it down. And, and is that where you should put displaced people? Um, but it's also thrown up in England questions about what is treachery and what is the nation state. Because this, because secular postmodernism has attacked the roots of the idea of a nation state, you, you can't be a traitor anymore. You can't be a traitor to something that doesn't exist. So um, I've been reading a, a very interesting novel about Kim Philby and the way in which he betrayed a whole generation of, uh, of intelligence service operatives between 1930 and 1970. And there was an absolute outrage up until 1970 that he was a traitor to the country. Now, between 1970 and 2018, the idea of being a traitor to your country 
has almost evaporated. Yes, so that when you when you see news bulletins or, or, or of people of commentators, there is a huge outcry to say, well, she's she is simply a world citizen who's in need of somewhere to have her baby. She didn't quite know what she's doing. She's still very young and she should be invited back. This is made more difficult by the fact, she says, I regret nothing. I saw a number of severed heads in dustbins of people that ISIS has killed, and that's just life. Uh, I saw a great deal of brutality, and these things happen when you struggle against the caliphate, and I want somewhere to have my baby, so I want to come back to Britain. One or, one or two commentators have said, she's not the victim. The victims of ISIS are the children who were blown to pieces in the Manchester arena by a terrorist bomber. These are the real victims, and she has been breeding, setting out to breed jihadi warriors to continue that, that violent assault on Judeo-Christian tradition. So society is divided about whether she should be invited to come to Britain. Again. Has there been any response from the Anglican uh, Church? Uh, Lambeth or Bishop? I know you guys have wonderful bishops who like to respond to these types of controversies. <laughs> and hey, I'll put my hand up. I want some. I have something to say. You know, any of that yet? Uh, the last bishop I saw was the Bishop of Chelmsford uh, telling gay activists in the House of Lords debate that they wouldn't be disappointed when Living in Love and Faith was produced and they would see how their, their LGBT activism found a resonance at the heart of the Church of England. But no, I haven't heard him or anybody else saying anything about this issue. The Church of England is very careful about what issues it, say, it speaks on publicly. Uh, it's kept out of this so far. Okay. Everybody is dying to know. Well, okay, not everybody. I'm dying to know. Uh, I've been following this story of Brexit now for uh, since before the vote. I'm like, wait a minute. You can leave the European Union? You have some self-autonomy? Well, the English are never going to go for that. Uh, it'll probably be a 70-30 vote because the English are certainly comfortable being in the European U Union. And I was talking to Peter Old at that time about this. He says, yeah, they're not. It'll go for vote, and it'll be overthrown, and you know, probably. And he and he was rightly to say, yeah, it's probably a fifty-two percent, forty-eight percent, Kevin. Um, but it's still Brexit's not going to pass. Well, to my surprise, to Peter Old's surprise, and to all of the UK, guess what? They voted to uh, leave the European Union, and the saga now has gone on for a long time because they want to negotiate the leave. They don't want to just cut ties and, hey, we're out of here and not have any of the uh, gumption that comes with being a powerful country like Britain really is. So we are to the point now that I read every other day in the paper, you're about to Brexit, but May hasn't told anybody how it's going to work. And I, are, is that where we are now? I think it's important not to underestimate a generational divide. Right? Um, in the years, in the decades following my generation, Teachers uh, and educators of all kind launched an enormous assault uh, on the notion of being English uh, or being British, on the idea of nationhood, and instead tried to replace it with multiculturalism, which Correct. of course is completely transnational. Uh, at the same time, people seem to have become afraid. They've become afraid of taking responsibility. There is a, there is a sort of um, statist element in people's mind. It's almost as if the state is replacing the parents. This is exactly what Orwell uh, and Huxley foresaw. And so 10 years behind me, there is a, a whole generation of people who want the state to take care of their lives and to make sure everything's okay. And the bigger the state, probably the better it can do it. A and yet, taking responsibility, holding corrupt politicians to account, and, and remembering uh, some vestige of national identity has still was still just strong enough to produce the Brexit vote. Now, at the moment, the question is whether or not the people, the elite, who are the politicians, uh, who are also in favour of multiculturalism and state life, whether they will uh, ditch their responsibilities to the democratic majority and fudge Brexit so that we stay half in and half out, or whether they will uh, fulfil the democratic mandate they were given, which is simply to leave on world trade authority ru rules uh, and create new balance and new trade partnerships. Now, Mrs. May is not telling everyone what her 
her scheme is, but it appears to be. She, she had a, an administrator who was caught in a Belgian bar the other day. Uh, where he's paid a great deal of money, but apparently the, the lure of two for the price of one was too much for him. And so he was standing in his, his name is Ollie Roberts. He was standing in a, a bar proclaiming loudly what Mrs. May's strategy was, which is simply <laughs> to, to wind the clock down till the very last minute. And then to say, then to produce people with two of the three choices, either the deal that she has struck, which leaves us permanently in a customs union and uh, is problematic by, with, with the Irish backstop, or to delay Brexit indefinitely by rescinding Article 50, which the European Union have said quite rightly, because they'd like our 39 billion pounds that we will owe them, <clears throat> that they'd be happy to do. It just kicks the can down the road. But the one that everyone voted for by implication, which is we leave on the 29th of March, deal or no deal, in this case, no deal, that would be off the table. And the question is, are the politicians sufficiently afraid of the voters to take that off the table and to leave us either uh, in, in half in, half out of Brexit or still in Brexit with a can kicked down the road? And then would people take to the streets um, would would people? Oh look, <laughs> George. Yeah, keep going. He, he's he's. We're not going to uh, edit him in. We're going to finish up with you real quick, and then we'll, we'll have George because you got to leave so, in about five minutes. So so that's the excitement, um, and we we're waiting to see. We have another uh, we have another six weeks to discover whether the politicians will fulfil the democratic mandate, uh, and if they don't, whether they'll be rioting on the streets I, I will certainly go and riot very happily if either of those two uh either of those two conclusions are passed by parliament now i we talked before about whether or not uh the church has responded to uh repatriation i can't even say it this morning sorry um they have certainly spoken to brexit at all levels from justin welby to um the archbishop of york what have their responses been to brexit well, it's quite incredible, Kevin. We know very well that bishops have, and senior appointments have been filtered on the basis of their approach to sexuality for 20 years now and for, and for gender. Um, I had no idea that they had worked out who was pro and anti-Brexit as well because there are no Brexiteers. We had one bishop, a man called Mark Rylands, who found the stress of being an Anglican bishop so great that as the suffragan bishop of Shrewsbury, and a very good bishop he was too, uh, he's retired from bishoping and gone to be a parish priest in the Diocese of Exeter. There aren't any. It's a clean sweep. Uh, and, and you don't, you know, is, is this simply because the psychological profile that they've chosen excludes people who believe in the values that Brexit represents? Or is it some kind of historical accent? Anyway, there aren't any, Kevin. They're yes. all completely in favour of remaining part of the, of, of the multicultural, uh, uh, the state is my, is my, my good parent. Uh, European project. The piglet next to the sow. Yep, I know what you're talking about. Well, Gavin, I want you have a meeting to run to. I want to let you uh, get to that. Uh, I have George in the bank to come up next, and it's going to be a wonderful day of recording two unscripteds for the price of one. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashton, and you've been listening to Anglican Unscripted, episode 487 on Valentine Plus One, February 2017.